there's been many a days where I'm like, what did I do? What did I start? Welcome to the I Did Not Sign Up For This podcast, a bi-weekly show dedicated to highlighting the incredible stories of everyday people. No topic is off limits. Join me as we explore the lives and experiences of guests through thought-provoking, unscripted conversations. And if you enjoy this show and would like to support this podcast, consider joining my Patreon. You'll gain instant access to over 70 exclusive bonus episodes, entries into giveaways, a discount on merch, and more. Your support allows me to continue bringing you these important stories. Stories. So head over to patreon.com slash I did not sign up for this and become part of the community. I'm your host, Carling, a Canadian queer identifying 30 something year old providing a platform for the stories that need to be heard. Good morning, Candice. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. I'm enjoying a rainy day here where I am in High River. So. Oh, I didn't know you were in High River. I love mm-hmm. High River. That's so nice. You know where it is. Yeah. Yeah. That is, that is the place to be in High River for sure. <laughs> yeah. The Hitchin Post with their milkshakes. Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. Well, I have been super excited to talk to you. I've actually followed you for a really long time. And then somebody shared a video you did. And you were so kind to say yes so <laughs> eagerly. So thank you. Yeah. I always am like shocked when like shocked. Because this is kind of like a new realm for me. What do I call it? Because I'm just kind of diving into this world of like disabled influencers and podcasting and sharing my story. And so I'm the same way. People are like, no, you just got to reach out and ask to be on podcasts. I'm like, no, that seems weird. So I'll just wait, <laughs> wait for people to come to me. So, yeah. Yeah. Like considering I'm very rejection sensitive, like I sure put myself in a position where... I like face it a lot. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, never thought of it that way. (laughs) Well, it is good to meet you finally. I would love it if you could introduce yourself, say who you are, where you're from, what you do, and then we'll get into your story. Sure. So my name is Candice McCormick. I am 40 years old and I live in High River, Alberta. And what do I do? This year has been an interesting year in regards to what I do. I used to be an event planner for 10 years and ran an event company and then changed my whole life this year. And since then, I've just kind of been trying to figure out where I'm going. And that's where I've really leaned into the disabled influencer, disability advocate role. And then I guess we are wondering why I do that, but it's because I was born with genetic disorder known as spinal muscular atrophy or SMA and so I have been in a wheelchair since I was three and so my whole life has just been about disability and advocacy and learning how to navigate life through that so yeah that's a little bit about me wow I could go on for hours about me (laughs) (laughs) I feel like we live like such parallel lives I'm turning 40 this year I am an event planner like by day and mm-hmm. yeah, I'm also into podcasting. So yeah. very cool. I did not know that you were an event planner. That's exciting. <laughs> yeah, it's it's exciting, but it's a hustle. Like where I work yesterday, we had two weddings and yeah. the power went out. I work at the zoo and the power went out on the oh. entire zoo, like three minutes before the ceremony of one of them. And I was like, what's the protocol here? What do we? <laughs> oh, my goodness. But in my look time, back on. Yeah. I was like, in 10 years, I never dealt with no power. So that would be yeah. first. Yeah, it was a first for me. So it was good. But yeah. yeah. Well, so can you maybe say a little bit about what is spinal muscular atrophy for those that don't know? Yeah. So spinal muscular atrophy is a genetic disease that affects your motor neurons. So that basically affects things like Walking is the number one thing, breathing, chewing, swallowing, and then obviously it goes into anything with your hands and arms. There are, I actually just learned this the other day, there are now five types of spinal muscular atrophy. I thought there used to only be three, but now there's a couple more added in there. So we're learning. And so I have um, type two. So mine was later onset. So my parents noticed it when I was about Right around that year old, I wasn't doing, reaching certain milestones. I quit doing things that I was doing, like holding my own bottle. And then I wasn't like trying to walk or trying to crawl. 
And so when they got me tested and took me to the doctor, they found out that I had spinal muscular atrophy, type 2. Back then, it was really funny, though, because it was never called type 2. It was called Wernick Hoffman's disease. <laughs> so, oh. Yeah, yeah, the types SMA came in way, type 2 sounds way better. easier. Way easier. Yeah. And so, yeah, SMA for everybody is a gradual worsening of your abilities, basically. So for the first little bit of my life, it was all about adapting to life in a wheelchair. I was very prone to like illnesses. So like a simple cold turns into pneumonia quite quickly, which ends up in hospital stays, things like that. And then once I got out of school, I got a little bit healthier. <laughs> but that's good to know. And then, yeah, I feel like from my probably about 18 to 25-ish, I'm going to say, maybe 30, I was pretty steady. That's kind of when I had opened up my event planning business. I was doing all the things and doing the 15 plus hour days, no problem. And then over probably the last five to six years, I've noticed another decrease in my ability. So the biggest things are for me that I'm noticing is I used to be able to do my own hair, my own makeup. And those things are like very difficult now. I basically cannot do them. And so it kind of affects everybody differently. So you mentioned that you had spoke with Shaylin on your podcast before. Her and I have the same type and everything of SMA. But if you sat down and actually compared us on what our day-to-day activities and abilities are, we're very different. Of course, we have some similarities, but it's just an interesting thing. So although you categorize everybody is affected slightly different. And I imagine like being born in like 80s, 90s, what was the prognosis then for a diagnosis like this? Right. So first of all, when my parents were giving my diagnosis, I was the sixth kid in Canada to be diagnosed with SMA. Wow. So, yeah. So they didn't really know really what anybody was doing. I was like a kind of a little bit of a guinea pig for many procedures and tests and things like that. And so that's kind of interesting to learn because that, although SMA is a considered a rare disease, I think I know more people with SMA than I do many other yeah. prognosis out there. So, but at the same time, my parents were told that I wouldn't live to see my fifth birthday. And was there other than like therapies, was there, was there any medication treatment? No. So there was no medication. There's no care. And my parents were basically just told, like, take your home, live your life lover and best of luck kind of thing of course we they helped us get things like wheelchairs and I did do like physical therapy and stuff like that because again they didn't know if it was going to help or hinder or be a waste of time but we did it all so yeah wow no that's that's kind of I have literally grown up my whole life knowing but I, I don't mean that in the morbid way that it sounds like I've always known that SMA was probably going to be what ended my life at some point in time, but I've never right. ever dwelled on that fact. I've literally lived my life basically like everybody else. I've just done it from a wheelchair and learned to navigate around that. But I don't ever feel like that I missed out on anything, I guess. I also say to people, it's really interesting because I never walked, I never crawled or anything like that. So it's also kind of hard to miss something you never had. Being in a wheelchair yeah. for me is is my normal. This is just how my life has been. And I don't really think about it. I just go about my day like everybody else. So that's, I think, the most interesting part right now is like sharing my story and my doing disability advocacy because I'm like, well, no, this is just normal. It's a normal day-to-day task. But when people are like, wow, I never knew you had to deal with that. And like from simple things like phoning ahead to a restaurant, to make sure they're wheelchair accessible. And just because they say yes does not mean that they are. Because yeah. you'll get there and there'll be like one step. And I'm like, no, this is not accessible. <laughs> like wheelchairs do not do stairs, people. Not even one. So, yeah. So, no, it's just been an interesting thing to live. The last, this year when I turned 40, it was a very big party. Because never did we ever, any of my family or even myself, think I would make it to 40. Huh. I've, I've had friends with SMA who I think... My oldest friend so far was 32. Oh, wow. They, yeah, so it's crazy in that sense. And what are, I think, testament to your parents to 
be faced with this like medical unknown and, and not have the internet. They didn't have WebMD or Facebook support groups. I think or... that was maybe a blessing that we didn't have <laughs> WebMD. Yeah, that's fair. I do diagnose yeah. myself with like Me terminal too. all illnesses. the time. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, like there was no like the sense of community to find mm -hmm. people similar would have yeah. been so much harder to find. Mm -hmm. And did they just sort of raise you like, uh, we're going to raise this kid like a typical child and yeah. not sort of, yeah, treat her like her Different. diagnosis? No, absolutely. They, I remember a couple of funny stories are, it was summer time. My cousins were running through the sprinkler and my mom, I was like, well, can I run through the sprinkler? My mom was like, yeah, go in this, right? And then it did do a little bit of damage to my wheelchair. Like all of a sudden my, what I drive with wouldn't drive. And so we take, that's been my, we take it all in to get repaired. And the guys are like, so what happened? And mom's like, she was running through the sprinkler with her cousins. And then it just stopped working. And they're like, you let her run through the sprinkler? And my mom's like, why wouldn't I? Yeah. Right? Like all of her cousins were doing it. Why shouldn't she? And they're like. Well, because of her wheelchair, my mom goes, well, is it any different than her getting stuck in a rainstorm? Aren't these things supposed to be kind of prepared for that? Maybe not self-inflicted by running to the sprinkler, <laughs> but that was, that's how I grew up. I did everything. And it's funny because I talk to my cousins now and we talk about all the ways we figured out how to make it so that I could do what they did. And so that's my, I, growing up, I just never, I knew I was different but i didn't see it as a bad thing i guess was, right that's what it played it we always figured it out yeah. i love that <laughs> yeah. oh i love that so much and was it going into school so i guess mm -hmm. by five you survived the timeline that the mm -hmm. medical community gave you and yeah. then was it just like okay well now she goes to kindergarten because that's what you do yeah. So I actually, we, my mom and I always talk about this. We feel, you know how people talk about all like your six senses and when you have, maybe when you lose one, a different one becomes heightened, I'm going to say, so they're better. But I, by the time I was three, I was like kind of driving my mom crazy at home because I was like very smart and chatty and bored at home. So I actually started kindergarten when I was three and we just figured it out. Like I had that student aid with me and it's funny because she started with me in kindergarten and she went all the way to grade nine with me until I went to high school oh so my I was God. lucky in that sense and yeah so no I did I just started and not the funny story about that like when I was in the one class when I was in kindergarten class I somehow rolled over the side of the water table and flipped my wheelchair over and everybody made such a big deal about it and I was like just step me back up <laughs> I want to keep playing so those things didn't really face me but no I jumped right into school I did a couple years in kindergarten and then my mom basically was like she's ready to go just let her go into the next grade and so then I met my class and did nine years of school with them and even then like my classmates just like I feel very fortunate because I know some people really felt like excluded and bullied and I didn't experience that way back then we had a day where the doctors came into my classroom and at first I was there as part of it and then they took me away from it and the kids were allowed to ask anything they weren't allowed to like or they didn't have to feel worried about saying the wrong thing or being mean or anything and so I think that really helped that was I think grade two and then from there I don't know. I just feel like I did school like every other kid. Obviously, I think, well, I did gym class for a long time until we played dodgeball. One of the boys whipped a ball so hard it hit me in the side of the head. And I was like, fine for a couple minutes. Then, oh, no. Then the school was like, okay, you can't do that anymore. But yeah, now again, it's a like, liability. Yeah, it's not your liability. So again, I just, it was all very, very normal to me. I led a very normal life. In school, I had friends. They all came to my house because it was accessible, that kind of thing. So very fortunate in that way, I feel like. And did you have siblings growing up? Yes. So um, actually, when my parents are finding out about my diagnosis, they also told them that there would be a 
I tried the other second child would have it too, but it was too late. My mom was already pregnant with my brother, but my brother was born and basically fine, but he does have a developmental disability. And in that sense, it's almost like this weird, perfect pairing. My mom always says, I have the brains and he has the brawn because he's so oh. freaking strong. So we made a good team everywhere we went. So yeah, yeah so no, yeah, just one brother. Then no more, oh. no more siblings. So yeah. And did you grow up in High River? I always say basically, I actually grew up in uh, a little town called Blackie. It's 15 minutes oh, outside yeah. of High River. Yeah. So I grew up there. Wow. And so that probably helped. Like you had that same core group of students. Yes. Yes. And I think just small towns, that helps. Yeah. And it felt like your classmates stay your classmate forever, basically. And uh, one of my favorite stories is I was actually planning our 10-year reunion for high school. And one of the guys I went to high school with ran into somebody from our grad class and was like, oh, are you coming to the reunion? And they're like, oh, what reunion? He's like, oh, Candace is planning it. And the funny thing is in high school, there was like five Candaces in their class. So he, the one, whoever he was talking to says, oh, which Candace? And, he's, and for some reason, he couldn't like think of my last name, but he's, you know, she was from Blackie and, and he's telling this person all these things, except the girl in the wheelchair. <laughs> and he like was the like, one identifying. <laughs> the one main identifying factor. I was like, why don't you just say it? He goes, I don't know. That's not how I see you. That's not what I would use as an identifying factor to you. I was like, next time, just say it. It's okay. Because yeah. it's an easily identifying factor. I was the only person in the wheelchair in our whole high school. So they would know what I was talking about. But it's just interesting, right? Because I did the whole grade 1 to 12 with those same kids. So that was nice. Wow. And no. going to high school, you had to switch like student aides or did you no longer need a student aide? No, I had to switch student aides. Mine was, mine was ready to retire. I'm not joking after doing 10 years of school with me. And so, but again, I left out and I did my four, I always say my four years because here we do grade nine to 12 and had same student aid for that part too. So yeah, lucky really because I yeah. know what people swap through and it's very difficult for them but and I, I imagine yeah that. every time you have to reestablish, you know what kind of care you need and what your preferences are and yeah I yeah. think that was probably my biggest like concern going to high school it wasn't like going to a new school and being with other kids or anything I was like I have to teach somebody else how to like help me and when you're used to the same people helping you don't really talk about it so I wasn't I I would say even now I'm not great at like training like a new caregiver because yeah. I've walked out and I've been with the same people for a year. So when yeah. I do have to train a new one, it's really hard to think, okay, what do I need help with? Plus you just have to have that level of comfort. Like they're helping you do very personal things like wiping your butt. So yeah. you're up close and personal with people. So yeah, yeah. but no, I lucked out. Great, great student aid. Oh. Both times that I have done my best, I should say. What do they do for you in school from kindergarten? Was there, aside from personal care, was there other things that they helped you with? Yeah. Yeah. So in elementary school, for the first few years until I got my power chair when I was three, it was like pushing me around because I couldn't even push my own manual wheelchair around. So it was that. And then just back then I was doing certain things like I had a standing frame. So I she helped me get into the standing frame. I'd have to have moments throughout the day where I'd go and do certain stretches because they wanted me to stretch so many times throughout the day in kind of like higher grade, like six, seven. Our school, we had to fight to get an elevator put in it because our higher levels were up this flight of stairs. And so my student aide used to actually carry me up and down. I had to have a manual wheelchair at the top where the classrooms were. And then I had my power chair downstairs and she'd have to carry me up and down. So we had to fight to get an elevator because you let 60 kids out of the class and it's kind of like a stampede going down the stairs yeah. and so we fought for that my mom fought for that I shouldn't say we did it my mom did it even in those like higher elementary grades they would help me take notes for class and then more just it's more per more personal things if I drop my pencil to have somebody pick it up and carry my books and then probably even in high school one of my classes was just a spare class or I'd miss out on gym class and I'd get a bit of a rest time. So I'd get to go and lay down. I always had a room that 
the school somewhere that had a bed just for me to like rest to regain energy and so they'd help me like transfer out of my chair and under the bed and back so yeah in terms of technology like the first thing I thought when you said taking notes in today's world the technology is so advanced for the disabled community Mm -hmm. to be able to do things like that can you share a bit about like how technology has changed to help you from like where you started to what's available today yeah Basically, we didn't really have any technology that helped me way back then. Because even like when I was in high school, we were still on like flip phones. And you had to hit the button three times to get a letter. Whereas yeah. like now, I know lots of people will take just their iPhone because it's something small and compact. And they can take their notes on their iPhone, um, which then can transfer to a computer or even just record the teacher's lecture. Yeah, we didn't have that. I had my student aid there taking notes which was also interesting because I'd have to be like oh can you write that down for the right. most part like I'd say from I could do my notes for about half of the class lengthwise before my arms would get tired of taking notes and then we'd both take notes so there'd be those few things that I would just jot down in case she didn't because she doesn't know what my brain needs and that from then in the moment I didn't know what my brain needed so it was kind of just learning yeah that balance because no technology even like the advancements in wheelchairs right that's impressive like they now lift and tilt and before it was just this chair on wheels literally right yeah. and didn't go very fast and now they can go pretty quick so that's been interesting to grow up through that part of it and just see those advancements and how much easier things like school especially i think school was the hardest part once you get to work, once you get to the work life, I feel like we all kind of get forced into a job that's like disability friendly in a weird right. way. So I feel like when I did decide to be an event planner, one, I started my own company because then I could flex it around my schedule and yeah. my abilities and what I could do. I obviously had people that worked for me and helped me to execute the job, but I did have one job out of high school where I the most I ever would have been was a receptionist no offense to receptionists but yeah but I, that is like a job you think that yeah you might end up yeah and and when you're told too that you're not going to live past your fifth birthday we didn't plan for me to do post-secondary education I didn't really think about necessarily what I want to be when I grow up I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up but, <laughs> right it's just you very much live in the now you don't really plan a lot ahead even planning sometimes for next year seems a little bit overwhelming. Did yeah. that really impact you in terms of like in school? I remember doing like a career planning class. Mm -hmm. And did they change how they approached it with you or did that impact you? Mm -hmm. I don't feel that they changed it. How they approached it with me, they just were like of the mentality of, of course you're going to go to college. And of course you're going right. to get a job. I've always felt like my community was very accommodating and encouraging in that sense but for me definitely impacted me I was like I don't know I've never thought about I don't just get to be like oh I want to be a this because I have to think okay well can I be that and what are all the modifications that could come alongside of that right. right what are the chances I'm going to find that job where the place is going to be willing to make those accommodations you know even just sitting here at my desk I use a special desk that lifts to a certain height to make things more comfortable for me. Many places want an accommodate for that. So even just doing a receptions job could be difficult for you, right? So right. I think it impacted me in the sense of one, oh crap, <laughs> I never thought about this part of my life moving forward. And then two, it kind of got overwhelming because what can I do versus what I want to do, I think has always been different. This sounds kind of funny, but I'm like two jobs that I think I would have, careers I would have picked, I would have been like, a really fancy bartender or waitress where you get to make yeah. fancy cocktails. I think that will be fun because I love people and meeting people and chatting with people. Or I would have went somewhere into the beauty, like whether it was hairdressing or makeup or something like esthetician wise, I would do that. But those are not mod jobs you can easily modify yeah. <laughs> into the wheelchair life. So yeah, so it's just kind of been funny. I think, like I said, I've always said, I've never really once picked my job. I've always kind of been forced into it other than the event planning thing. And I think I did that a little bit to be st stubborn and to show 
people that I can do what I set out to do. And that was probably my hardest life lesson this year was I got to a point where running staff, not having the abilities, even I had five years ago to show them how to tie a chair sash, I couldn't do that any longer. And so it was really hard to train people when I couldn't show them what I was doing. And so then I get frustrated and they get frustrated and it just became a kind of a bit of a toxic place to be. And so when I made the decision to not do it anymore, you struggle with that feeling of like that you failed in a weird way. And then also, now what am I going to do? And I still really truly don't know what I'm doing. I feel like I'm learning as I go. But I think when I did make the decision to stop event planning, I really wanted to lean into the disability advocacy. I think it's hit me more now that I, I feel like I turned 40 and things started to open up in a different way because I, I do feel like I have a story to share and experiences to share and ways to create change. And so I just really wanted to be able to take my time and dedicate it to that. It was like a blessing, but also sad at the same yeah. time. Yeah. yeah, I think both things can be true at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's such a important time in our lives with the access to social media and the internet and all of these things because it does create this open space for like disability, well, for all advocacy, but mm-hmm. you know, really being the representation that I think so many like families need. And yeah. you know, like if what if your mom had had TikTok or, you know, being right. able to connect with other parents or yeah. adults that have grown up with SMA. I think for even me, as I'm connecting with more people in the disability world itself, but also with SMA around the world, it's also a blessing and a curse, I would say, because you learn about things. So I've mentioned before how when my parents were given my diagnosis, there is no treatment, no cure. But now there is treatment out there. And I'm like, I always kind of lose my words at this point because I try not to sound too negative about it. But right now I'm actually fighting to get access to treatment. And the long of the short of it is that right now the guidelines set in place in Alberta is 25 years. So it just feels like a weird, harsh slap in the face that like you've defied the odds. You've made it to 40. And now there's something out there that can drastically slow the progression and potentially give you some of your abilities back. I'm very, I'm not naive. I will never walk again. My body's been like this for far too long. But if I could get back to curling my own hair, that would be such a win. Or some of the big things I noticed, I only use plastic glasses. And even then, I'm nervous to pick them up sometimes because I'm not quite sure if I can get it from the table to my mouth and not drop it. If I could gain those little things back, that's kind of my biggest message out is that there are many people in the world that don't get to do tasks that many people take for granted. So things like brushing my teeth is an exhausting task for me because it's that repetitive motion and you're supposed to brush your teeth for two minutes. So that two minutes feels like two hours. And by the time I'm done, I'm just ready to go to bed. But then things like I would love to be able to make my own bed or cook my own supper things like that. And so that's really what I want to share with people because I get it. We all are allowed bad days, but when you're mad that your husband didn't make the bed and you had to do it, then be grateful that you can. So have you like in your life received any sort of treatment as it became available or were you always on sort of the cusp of not qualifying for it? So this is where I'm definitely learning more so I do believe I will take ownership of maybe not doing my part but I think when I was younger I, and there was no nothing on the market for us I didn't want to be burdened by being submitted into clinical trials because in those clinical trials you could be getting the real deal or the placebo yeah all that kind of thing and I feel like it could have given kind of like a bit of false hope so I didn't really fight for it back back in the day but now seeing these treatments come out and seeing what they're doing for people now I'm like okay I wish that I always had the opportunity to be asked so I've I've never been asked do you want to go on this trial we're seeing great results and so that's part of kind of this fight for treatment yes I'm 
trying to get treatment and lobbying our government to kind of change policy about who gets it and things like that. But then also lobbying to the drug company that makes these treatments. One, why make something and make it so unattainable for most people? Because it's the one that I'm working towards right now costs about a thousand dollars a day. And I'd have to take it every day for the rest of my life. So in one year, it's $356,000, which is an overwhelming number. But that came out about five years ago. And I was patiently waiting, thinking, no, the government will come around, let the clinical trials finish. And now as I've dove into this fight, because I don't, not that I don't want to wait, but I no longer can wait. I can definitely on like a, probably a daily basis, just notice changes and losing ability and I don't want to wait anymore. So I decided to do this, but now I've learned that part of the reason why the 25 year age stop started was because most of the clinical trials were done on that age range. Right. There wasn't very many people over the age of 25. So then I'm like, well, let, let me in. Yeah. Let me in. And, and now it's at the stage where you wouldn't be on like a placebo. You would be on the real, the deal, real deal so yeah. that they could actually study what it's doing because they're seeing such great things. And then it's really just mind blowing to me that in the UK, it's approved for everybody. And they just give to them. And they, so then now that I'm starting to share my story and this, I've had people reach out on Instagram and they're like, what do you mean you don't get it? And I'm like, no, we don't get it. The clinical trials aren't done. It's only to tw- age 25. And they're like, no, look at these. And they send me all these clinical trial reports, which is also way over my head because it's a lot of scientific talk, which yeah. is not my forte. But I'm like, oh, this is wild. And so when I took on this fight to get treatment, I think I was maybe a little cocky about it. Oh, yeah. Well, there's all these things, but everything is such a, there's not just one thing. It's not just let's raise this kind of money. Right. It's now, well, no, we need to make changes in policy because I know even just in my area, I know three other ladies that I've estimated that have been denied treatment as well. So I want to make changes in that because why? if it's happening yeah. in other places and you're seeing great results, then why not? So that's one thing. And then that goes both to your government and to the drug companies. Because then if it's clinical research that you want, then why aren't you reaching out to us? People that are in that next age gap to get on these studies or how do we go about doing that because I've done a lot of reading and (laughs) looking and searching and I just don't know how you get on them I just think like why not if other countries have done the research and what's missing what's missing from the UK data to allow Canada to approve it and let's just hyper focus on that and get it approved right we know you can approve things pretty quick after the last couple years yeah, no. exactly. Let's, let's do something that actually makes an impact on people's lives. And I think I was like, no, I know. Like I, Shay gave me lots of advice of saying, this is an emotional roller coaster that you were diving onto. And I was like, I'm good. I got a strong heart and head and I'll be fine. But there's been many a days where I'm like, what did I do? What did I start? Because now that can is open, it's just like this can of worms that I'm trying to sort through and I don't feel like there's any one spot to focus on so I kind of have to focus on it all and so now it's just a matter of no this is where social media comes in well I need to get viral I need to be I need to be the loud squeaky wheel and have people share my story and get in touch with people like you to share it on platforms like your podcast and yeah not not stop until we get some answers or changes or something. Yeah. And it's so hard mm-hmm. when you know that the power is in, I mean, I joke that politicians are all like old white men, but it's just in the mm-hmm. hands of these people who maybe have no, you know, like it's no, I don't know, skin off their back or. Yeah. It, Cause it doesn't affect them. Yeah. 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 And I, I'm always surprised like with Canada having universal health care, which like it's especially in Alberta needs some mm-hmm. help, but yeah. The cost, like to to just allow you into a treatment that is already available for some people, it would mm-hmm. reduce. It would overall reduce the cost of how much help you need, Absolutely. and how much care you need. Yeah. So it's not like it. Yeah, like it would only help the system. 
Yes, in the long to run. keep your independence as long yeah. as possible. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and those are the parts of the picture that never get focused on. I think now it's just a matter of dollars and cents and what's it going to cost. And they don't look at okay, this might cost us this now, but if over the next ten years I don't spend one day in the hospital, what does that cost? Yeah. If I now can go back to not having full time caregivers around me, I don't need as much care dollars. And yeah, they don't see like the yeah. the long term effects of what could be good. Yeah. 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 It's a very and then it's funny how little things come into play that I like three hundred and fifty six thousand dollars is a lot of money. I'm aware of that. It gets bigger by the day, I feel. When I was just sitting here the other day watching um, some reality. Oh, I was watching Big Brother. And they're fighting to win $250,000. And they give up three months of their life. And I'm like, I couldn't even go on that and win and pay for one year of treatment. Yeah. And these people are, like, giving up time and fighting for this money. And so it's just that part. Oh, that's a whole nother level of why do drug companies make something to help people but nobody can access it easily so it's a big battle <laughs> and yeah like i said i have many days where i'm like oh dear what did i start but i think that it just goes into what my new passion is of being a disability advocate and hopefully i reach the goal or make change to get the treatment and even like this is where i i'm a very middle ground thinker so i'm like maybe if i don't get the treatment. I hope that I can do enough to create some change so that the people that are still here and need treatment don't have to fight to get it because you just shouldn't have to fight for something that's going to prolong your life. What was the decision like? Or can you walk through this treatment came out, you saw it, you could have get it, you found out you can't. And then what were the conversations like leading up to saying, okay, let's start a GoFundMe. Let's try to make this change. Right. So when the treatments first came out, so right now there are actually three treatments on the market for SMA. One is called Zogensma. It's for infants, basically. So you need to get it before you turn two. That's even more money. I think it's like three million Canadian. So a few years ago, I don't know if you've seen or heard, but there was four or five families in Canada. I think they were just in Canada, two for sure in Alberta that were trying to raise that kind of money to get their kids treatment. But through law being the government, they were able to get it. So those were babies that literally just laid in people's arms. They had very weak cries, they had a hard time eating, things like that. If you follow any of their stories now, they're walking. They have braces and things like that, and they're doing therapy, but they're walking like regular kids and nothing's stopping them. And so that's fantastic. That was one kind of check mark off the list and the very interesting thing about these treatments is that when you find one that works it helps you adapt it to now the next stage of sma right and then sma falls under the category of muscular dystrophy and so there's 150 different types of muscular dystrophy and when we make strides in the sma treatment it helps make strides in the other types of muscular dystrophy so it's a beautiful chain reaction really so now so the two that are on the market that are proven to work for adults are spinraza it's a spinal injection my doctors are very what's the word i'm looking for they're not confident that they would be able to get the injection into my spinal column um being one of the first six kids in canada i was a trial for a lot of things so Part of our disease gives us scoliosis in our back. So I have rods and screws and wires and all sorts of things that's now been in my body for 35 years, I think it is. So there's just heart, like they're very, very concerned about trying to get that spinal injection into where it needs to be, to be effective without causing any other pain or damage, right? If you hit a nerve the wrong way, it could put me into a chronic pain situation, which I thankfully don't have right now. And so then the third medication that came out is called Rizdaplam, also known as a Breathe B. And it's an oral liquid that you swallow down and it does very similar things to the spinal injection, just less invasive, other than the fact that you have to take it every day for the 
rest of your life. And it costs a thousand, just under a thousand dollars a day. So I was the one where I was like, well, I've lived to be 35 and I wasn't supposed to. So I'll just wait. This is groundbreaking. I'm sure it'll move fairly quickly in the sense of I knew it was going to still take a couple of years. Nothing really moves quickly in the medical world. And I just was like patient. I was like, if I'm just patient, I will get it. And then it'll just come to me. And now, like I said before, in my last five years, I've just slowly lost more and more. It was almost like the treatment came out and it hyper magnified my perception on it, everything. Yeah. I think maybe I've always been slowly progressing, but I was just like, oh, it's normal. We're now knowing that there's something on the market that could drastically slow, if not slightly reverse it. It's hard on your mind. And I think it hyper focuses on, oh, now I can't do this. And now I can't do that. And oh, this is really exhausting. And it never used to be. So it's all hyper focused on now. So that part's really difficult. I think just like chatting with my friends really is how it came about. They were like, we still can't get it. And then we look into things and I tried the Compassionate Care Access program got denied. My doctors submitted it twice, tweaking the whatever the first reason was. And yeah, just continued to get denied from the Alberta government to cover the call. So then I was just like, I don't know. I've quit my career because I can no longer do my job effectively. And I kind of feel a little bit stupid just sitting here doing nothing now. Like maybe if I started this fight five years ago, Today, I'd be talking to you about a very different story. So my friends were like, well, let's just do this. So at first, it started off with, let's just do something to go viral, to lobby the government, to just get them to change it, and not to sound like selfish, but even if it just changed it for me. If all yeah. I did was get the medication, that's a step in the direction. But then as we talked about it more, people were like, somebody's going to hear your story, and they're going to want to help, and they're going to want probably want to feel like, well, let's just help. Can we help by giving you money or what can we do to help and it's more than just sending a letter to your MLA kind of thing. Yeah. So we thought, well, they kind of go hand in hand. And so yeah, my friend Kelsey just was like, okay, we're starting a GoFundMe. And I was like, oh to be honest, it still wouldn't fit well with me. Right. Because it just is a it's a lot of money. Like a lot of money. Nobody well not nobody. There are a few people in the world that could easily give you that kind of money. But it just is it seems like an unreachable task right now. And I feel like you're like me in that if it was for anybody else, I would advocate the <laughs> shit out of, you know, somebody <laughs> else's need. But if it was for me, I'd be like, oh, I don't know. It just feels, yeah. Well, and it, I think like it's like it really boils down to a life, I don't know if sound too bad, but like it's like a life or death thing. Yeah, I think you do need to sound dramatic, though. You know, you do <laughs> need to really convey... I feel like I do that for my own mental. Like, yeah. It's, it's weird to think that, but you you don't want to... It's a matter of making people feel bad, but not, not making them feel too bad, because that's what it comes down to, is that it's like time is of the essence. I, in the last five years, I've declined drastically, and right. I don't want to get to the point where I can't feed myself. But that list is endless of what other things I come to do. Yeah. Because I just, I've lived a very full, happy, busy life that if I have to stop doing all that things, to me, that's not living life anymore. It feels like such a balance because, you know, like your own mental health, you have to stay positive and you have to mm -hmm. keep saying these things while also balancing, you know, yeah. conveying the critical importance of this of this task of raising this money yeah. yeah and then we just live like there's so many things in the world happening that it that too seems overwhelming yeah. i think i launched my gofundme campaign and four days later like cologne and all that went on fire right yeah <laughs> right? and you're like okay i don't need the money these people <laughs> off the you feel so awful but it's there's just always a tornado going around you and like, at least, I mean, I don't know if this is the right attitude, but my first thought was, like, at least they have insurance. No, I thought that, too. Yeah, they've got things mm -hmm. in place that will, you know, not to undermine the Help trauma them. and the loss, but they will yeah. recover it. I definitely agree with that. I live in High River. We were the top yeah. of 2013. You were I'm the like, I've flood. experienced the loss. We didn't live in our house for three weeks. I get it. It's traumatizing. Yeah. But you can rebuild, thankfully. Hopefully most people didn't lose a life. And so it, it is fixable. And people 
easily step up and help you as we're seeing. And so that's where it's, my friends are really good because they bring me back down to being like, yeah, well, the government's going to help them but rebuild their houses yeah. and insurance is going to help them. And I'm like, okay, I'll try not to feel as bad now because there is, there's like a little bit of guilt, I guess, in asking for people because I'm like, plus economy, times are tough yeah. in general. So, but I'm like, if you just want to skip your Starbucks today yeah, and donate five bucks, Right. Yeah. Every dollar counts in this sense. So yeah. You just and gotta I wonder, keep that positive. I'm just like thinking of the psychology behind it is if I see somebody's house burn down or flood, I can envision that happening to me. And so I feel compelled. But something where, yeah. you know, I don't live with a degenerative disease and I am not a wheelchair user. And mm-hmm. so, you know, it's maybe it's like just a step further for people. Yeah, to connect with it, but I mean that's yeah. not an excuse. I'm like riled no, up no. about it now. No, I I'm ready to flip like... this desk. I'm so mad. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to my life. This is yeah, kind of like, and that's the thing. I think that's when I ba- try to balance the most. And I like I do want people to know I I have lived a very full, happy, n- normal, whatever that means to anybody life. But it's now changed, and I just want to keep living my wonderful, happy life life and so it's hard not to stay in that place of bad but I wanted to maybe turn my anger into fuel to do good and create change and again yes the GoFundMe is for myself but I'm hoping to create bigger change for other people so that none of us have to go through this process and I think the only way to do that is putting my life on blast basically so if people follow me on social media like I've said, I'm an open book. You can DM me questions. I showcase my day to day life. I'm trying to get better on it because I just did a Instagram takeover for the Love for Lewiston Foundation oh. for SMA month. And it was funny because as I'm like going through my day, I'm like, oh, I need to record this. <laughs> to me, it's very normal. This is a normal part of my day, but I'm like, oh, but not everybody else has to get somebody to help them. So it's yeah. interesting. And I'm trying to showcase that because, again, I agree. I think you need people to feel that connection of what it would be like or how yeah. to relate to it. So, yeah. Yeah. And what yeah. are some of the ways that, like, anybody listening or me, just like everyday people can impact? So I'm going to share your GoFundMe. And okay. that's like a huge piece is helping yeah. spread that, share it and, you know, yeah. donate what you can or share it yeah. to people who can donate. But what yes. are ways on a broader scope of changing these policies in government? So I have a website. Well, I put a page on my website now. I drafted an email template that you can email to your MLA. There's even a button on my website where you can click it, type in your postal code, and it'll give you all the contact information for your MLA. So. I've tried to make that as easy as possible. Again, that's not overly dramatic. But if you wanted to do that once a day, yeah, I think it's a matter of if hundreds, thousands, et cetera, people send their message to their MLA, that's the only way you're going to get heard. Yeah, so that's kind of the next level. If you are listening and you are somehow connected to somebody in the media, newspaper, radio, news station, that's also going to learn you learning curve now that news is now banned on all social media oh my god like i don't yeah i don't i don't know what's I, happening i had that. a new i had a local radio station do a story for story on me and my fundraising effort and then i'm trying to share it so other people can see it and it's saying no and i'm like oh yeah well so i'm like oh great just another hurdle in my yeah. battle because now it's not it's harder to share that news so but yeah Sorry, got off, caught off on a tangent there. So if you are in the media or know of somebody in the media, if you can have them reach out to me. I have a press release to share with them. I want to get on every possible podcast, news station, radio station, everywhere to just kind of spread that word and spread my message. And then I think one of the things that I've learned the most is my community needs to be bigger than just the people I know. So I want to expand my community. And I've definitely already done that so just you reaching out to let me come on your podcast and share my story that's been really amazing I've had a company reach out and we are going to do a little fundraiser thing and then it's just things like I have a 
13 year old cousin that makes gemstones bracelets. So she's making a limited edition bracelet that people can pre order, and she's giving 50% of it towards my fundraising efforts. So it's just little things like that. You know, the whole idea of many hands make light work. And so if you have ideas for me, that would be great. If you want to just take an idea and turn it into a fundraiser and run with it just tell me what you need and I'll happily get it for you it's just that it's just I think the way to get hurt is to go viral and however that might look is what we need to do so I'm an open book please reach out I'm happy to share and do my part to make it happen that's amazing. Well, you are such a joy. Like you're so you. <laughs> approachable and friendly. Your story is incredible and needs to be heard. So thank you. I feel like the very least I can do is have you on my tiny little podcast. Well, but, you're not tiny. You well, might feel tiny, <laughs> thank but you. you're not tiny. Oh. Well, I'm going to share the heck out of it and I'll tag you and everything. And yeah. yeah, yeah, just we'll keep following along your stories as you update it. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. (laughs) All right, Candace, thank you so much. Have an amazing day and we will talk again really soon. Thank you. All right, bye. Bye. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode. I hope you found our conversation informative and entertaining. If you enjoyed this episode, please don't forget to follow me on social media, share this podcast with your friends and leave a review at ratethispodcast.com slash I did not sign up for this. Your support means the world to me. If you want more interviews, exclusive content, and ad-free episodes, join the Patreon at patreon.com slash I did not sign up for this. I hope you all have a fantastic week ahead, and we'll talk soon. Hey there, welcome to 7th Heaven, a lesbian recap. I'm Lindsay, and I'm joined by my co-host and real-life partner, Carling. We're diving into the 90s hit drama through today's lens. Get ready for our off-the-cuff commentary and peeling back the layers of the Camden family. We'll tackle everything from family rules, life lessons, and 90s fashion. Join us every week for a light-hearted queer perspective and a trip down memory lane. Whether you're a die-hard fan or new to the show, this recap is for you. So find us anywhere you get your podcasts at 7th Heaven, a lesbian recap.